Hello, everybody. Today is, uh, let's see, April 10th, 2013. My name is Luke Thomas. This is the weekly MMA fighting live chat. The time on deck is about uh, 1.03 p.m. East Coast time. Got started just a few minutes late. Um, today on the docket, top of the sort of food chain of topics and or discussion points, the Fallon-Fox debate, not just about her situation, but about UFC heavyweight Matt Mitrione. Animals. Um, but you see Matt Mitri on his comments about the UFC code of conduct, so sort of everything in there. One note before I even say anything else. If you want to discuss this Fallon Fox issue, I'm happy to do it. Um, if you've got questions about it, to the extent that I can answer them, I will. I won't be able to answer a lot of things. I'm certainly not an expert in this field uh, any more than anybody else is, but um, uh, I will try to give as much helpful responses as I can. If your question is a referendum on the value in society of transgender people get to step in because this ain't the place for you. If your question is about hangups you have because you don't like transgender people, get to step in. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a politicization of the transgender issue. My only guideline here is what medical science says uh, and sort of my own basic framework of ethics tells me. That's it. That's the only place I'm working from. I don't want to get into sort of a left-right paradigm here. You're more than welcome to join the discussion if that's what you're here for. If you're not, this is not the place for you. You will be automatically IP banned from the site. Don't be that guy, okay? All right, moving on. Uh, in addition to all that brouhaha and all that negative stuff, there's a lot of positive stuff to look forward to. The Ultimate Fighter finale for Season 17 is on Saturday. Uriah Faber versus Scott Jorgensen. Uriah Hall himself. Lots to look forward to there. Of course, we've got the UFC on Fox. Coming up the weekend after, then UFC 159, lots to get to. Um, not just about all the negative stuff, certainly there's plenty of positive things as well. A um, couple of ground rules. If you like this video, either now or later, please give it a thumbs up here on this little Google window. That'd be appreciated. Subscribe to MMAfighting.com's YouTube videos, which where is where many of you are watching this right now. I would appreciate that as well. <laughs> My cat's literally coughing up a hairball during the live chat. Do you hear this? Thanks, Kat. Appreciate that, buddy. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. All right. Um, the way it works is as you look on MMAfighting.com, if that's what you're watching this, where the majority of you are watching this, there'll be some comments that are yellow, some comments that are white, some comments that are green. The green comments will get priority. They get those when they get three people to click the REC, the rec button. Um, I'll give priority to those throughout the course of the chat. If you're on Twitter right now or even on Facebook or whatever, um, the sound of my cat making a hairball is your chance right now. Get on uh, Twitter, get on Facebook, whatever social media platform you're using, and tell folks you're watching this right now. You can use the MMA Fighting link, and if you want to use a hashtag, it's in the post. It's called Chat Rappers, all one word, C-H-A-T-W-R-A-P-P-E-R-S, Chat Rappers. Use that right now. Tell folks you're watching it. Let everyone know. No budget for this little operation that we got going here, so I need your support to make sure that people learn about it. And, uh, of course, I always appreciate it. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, I believe that covers it. So why don't we get started? Because I got started a few minutes late. I mean, I'm obviously going to get to this Fallon Fox stuff. I, I don't know where to begin. So I'll just start from the top because I'm assuming I'm going to get to it pretty quick. Um, all right, so first question, Uriah Hall. How far do you think he can go? Chell has been bigging him up as a contender on the show, but is that not a bit premature? It is insanely premature. Um, so I, everyone knows that this, I swore off. Off Ultimate Fighter Forever, I'm not going to watch it again. Uh, I mean, I might watch an episode here or there, but I didn't watch a single episode this season. But I did manage to watch a fair number of fights. I did see all of Gastelum's fights. Uh, excuse me, Gastelum's fights. And I did see all of Hall's fights. Um, listen, there's no denying Uriah Hall is very, very talented. Very, very, very good. You have to acknowledge him much. He's obviously a very dynamic athletic striker in particular. That really seems to be 
um, where he shines. And he's not just a guy who's sort of a meat and potato striker who's effective. He, he can do the whole thing. He's got great jab and great footwork. Um, he's got quick kicks. And sort of what I, what I mean by that is I don't mean he's like naturally fast, although he is. You know, from foot to target, the, if you kind of stopwatch, he gets there pretty quick. Uh, um, and it's not that he uses a lot of trickery, although he has, you know, good fans and whatnot, too. You know, he jabs the guard until you put your hands up, and then he goes to the body. So, like, there's any number of ways I can really describe the positive things about Uriah Hall. If you're asking me, still a little bit unconvinced about his ground game. Wasn't particularly uh, amazed by what he showed there in the semifinals. Certainly with that Kimura from half guard, and by that time, uh, when he got the, the sort of the hip bump sweep to move to mount at the end there, um, you know, Listen, you can't deny somebody's win. All I'm simply trying to tell you is I don't know how often that's going to happen at the upper echelons of the MMA uh, UFC's middleweight division. So uh, certainly one to watch, certainly one to respect. One of the better prospects in a very long time. One of the best runs on the Ultimate Fighter in terms of what he did on that show, irrespective of what he does in the future going forward. Got a lot of positive things to say about Uriah, Faber, or, excuse me, Uriah Hall. One thing to note, however... You guys have to understand what that show is, and you know what the show is. The show is a show designed to promote the UFC, designed to promote UFC various players, so Dana White, uh, Chael Sonnen, John Jones. Um, but it's designed to promote these guys generally. Now, the reason why the show has fallen flat a lot is because they've promoted these junior Brownings, but the real guys who come through are your kind of McGregor's guys who don't come through the normal sort of farm system the UFC has set up for itself. They come through um, the more traditional model. Uh, you know, I'm not here to sort of get into that debate, but you, your blue chip prospects typically don't come through the Ultimate Fighter. Maybe Uriah Hall is a bit of a, a, a difference there. Um, all I'm sort of pointing out to you is that show is designed to make them look good. Now, that doesn't mean they don't expose weaknesses. That doesn't mean you can't make somebody look good who's not good. Um, but they can make you look your best, and sometimes they can make themselves look better than maybe they actually are. So all I'm sort of pointing out to you is all your hope and enthusiasm about Uriah Hall is very justified. I have it too. I'm very excited to see somebody that good come out of the reality show. But as high as your expectations might be, they should be tempered, or I should say as high as your enthusiasm might be, it should be tempered a little bit about the reality of what he might face, even in a division as traditionally weak as um, as middleweight. All right. Hardy's future. Do you think the UFC will, would take the risk of allowing Hardy to fight with a known heart condition if he is sanctioned in another state? And also, do you think other states will follow California's example now that his condition is known? Um, Good question. So Dana White yesterday, yesterday said on the conference call they're going to send him to another doctor. I think what they might do is if Hardy is – I don't think they want to lose Hardy. Hardy's still valuable. He's still young. Um, people like him. But this is probably a bit of a stumbling block. I think if California had issues with it, New Jersey would too. Also, it should be noted, California had an issue. At least they had spotlighted it with their EKG, but it was really the UFC that pulled, them, pulled him from the card. Um, Stephen Morocco did some good reporting over an MMA junkie about that. But needless, needless to say, let's sort of assume that Jersey would have some kind of issue with it. Um, I think that what the UFC is trying to do now, which is get a uh, second opinion from another doctor who could say, yes, he has this condition, but you know, we're talking about a realistic possibility of some sort of life-altering injury as a function of this condition being so infinitesimally small that it's negligible. And under those considerations, being able to continue again. But I don't think they're going to force Hardy into surgery. And if they can't get that second opinion, I don't, I don't really see how they proceed. But I suspect that they can. I suspect that there are plenty of doctors who uh, feel like the, the risk to Hardy, given the state of his condition, and by that I mean the, the way that how bad his wolf's heart condition thing is, in conjunction with um, what medical science literature there is about how risky this activity might be in conjunction with his own particular performance, uh, there might be a way out of this through that by finding other doctors, not to sort of corroborate the UFC's needs, but who on their, of their own volition take a different opinion. This happens all the time. It's not, it's not in any way uncommon or unethical. It's, it's, it's you know, um, I'm sure that that kind of person exists. It's 2013 and Doug the Rhino Marshall is a Bellator tournament champion. Who in the world saw that coming? What are the chances he gets the dreaded KD on Schlemenko? 
Um, I don't think he has any chance of getting the KD. If you know guys who know Doug Marshall, back in his he does it less so now, but he used to do it a lot back in his um, WEC days. He used to say that he doesn't want knockouts; he wants uh, knock deads, KDs, um, <laughs> which is hilarious for any number of reasons. But uh, no, I did not see that coming. I, I, I'll just call it. I did not see him getting past the semifinals, and certainly not. Uh, I, I actually predicted him to beat Brett Cooper, although I do believe, generally speaking, Brett Cooper's a better fighter. Um, but I don't think he's going to beat Shlomenko. If you've never seen Shlomenko fight, whatever his limitations are, uh, toughness and durability and a, an absurd chin ain't one of his problems. Um, he went five rounds with Hector Lombard, and for the first, like, three, maybe two and a half rounds, Hector Lombard teed off on this fool, and he just took it. I don't think there's anything as hard as Marshall hits. And I admit, if nothing else, Doug Marshall hits really hard. Even under those considerations, I have a hard time believing he's going to put Shlomenko away. And plus, like the way he likes to brawl, he's just going to open himself up. You know, uh, I did pick Marshall to beat Cooper reluctantly, but I did. I would never pick him to beat Shlomenko. But at Bellator Tournament, man, it produces weird, weird things. Luke, we all know your views on the Fallon Fox issue, but I'm curious to get your take on CNN being covered. Excuse me, but I'm curious to get your take on the UFC being covered on CNN's breaking news yesterday. It's not often that our sport is covered by national news sites like CNN, and unfortunately, when it was yesterday, it wasn't in the best light. However, is there a silver lining here? Can UFC Swiss swift action in suspending Mitrion be seen as a positive for the company? Um, Yes and no. Here's the interesting part about the CNN story. When someone initially sent me the link, I thought it was like an AP story that they re-ran or a Bleacher Report story that they re-ran. Because you know that CNN and Bleacher Report have this sort of like, uh, um, they were bought out by Turner. But it wasn't. It was an independent CNN article that was written about it. And obviously, as you mentioned here, um, they were covered on um, the breaking news. Now, I haven't seen any of the. If there was video footage and video coverage, I have not seen it. But let's just sort of assume that that CNN article got some run. It was also in the Huffington Post, too, by, by, for example. So, on balance, it's not good. And the reason why it's not good is because, um, how do I say this? It is much easier to make a mess than it is to clean things up. It is much easier to cause chaos. It is much easier for bad news with a bad headline about a bad thing somebody did to spread and to be absorbed than it, and to be and to be and for that to be the information leader. Like that's the first thing that came. The second thing that came was the UFC issue, what I thought was a very smart, swift, definitive response. Um, mostly definitive. There's an issue about how are you going to suspend a guy who doesn't even have a fight. But let's sort of say, for the time being, for the average person who reads that. They were unequivocal in their denunciation. It came quickly, and it came forcefully. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and it hit all the right notes. Like, we have respect for the LGBT community. Uh, this is not one of our core values. This is a function of him running afoul of the code of conduct. Like, it hit all the right notes. But the problem is it always comes after the fact of somebody creating a disaster and them trying to put the pieces back together. It's just, it's just easier to cause chaos than it is to cause order. You know, I don't know how else to explain it. That's sort of the way life works in many ways. So while I agree with you that, A, the UFC deserves credit for the, um, the speed and veracity with which they issued their condemnation, and I also agree with you that there is a bit of a silver lining there that, you know, I, I know we've all heard Dana White char characteristically say, I'm never going to repeat what a lawyer says to me. Okay, fair enough. And that maybe works for Dana White. But for the company generally... The other companies, Coca-Cola, Pepsi, Apple, Samsung, Big Lots, Home Depot, all these major companies have lawyers for a reason. It's because they work. You need them. Uh, and clearly, some lawyer wrote that response, wrote it perfectly, and it struck all the right notes in as much as one could in that particular circumstance. So on balance, no, it's not really good. However, um, organizationally, it, the, you have to admire the nimbleness with which the UFC treated a giant pile of steaming S that was handed to them. 
Um, not, not, you know, there's not much they can do at that point except those things, and they did those things. And organizationally, and in terms of infrastructure, would they have done that four or five years ago? I don't, I don't know that they would have or could have. Fighter dies in Michigan. Um, firstly, thoughts to the man's family. I agree. Secondly, what more can be done to ensure the safety of competitors at the lower level of the sport? I assume it's too expensive on these small shows to test fighters before the fight like they do in the big shows. Yeah, well, as I understand it, um, that show was not regulated. It was not a regulated show. So there is the first problem. I mean, listen, I, I've said this over and over and over and over again, and it's not really a great answer because all, all it really does is present to you problems about um, – that they can't, there's really no easy solution. But I'm just telling you this. If you're watching this and you fight MMA or you train jiu-jitsu or whatever, or you know somebody, you could tell them this. If you fight amateur MMA in this country outside of California, outside of Nevada, even in Nevada really, but definitely outside of New Jersey for the East Coast, you're taking your life into your hands. Um, and I suppose that's true for any sort of contact sport like football, certainly true for professional MMA. All I'm pointing out to you is, the level of danger relative to the amount of regulation in professional MMA is uh, much closer than the level of danger relative to the level of screening in amateur MMA. Amateur MMA, if you know anybody who's ever fought in amateur MMA, and even historically in California too, they don't know if their opponent's on steroids, they don't know if their opponent has HIV, they've never done a blood test, no one checked their hand wraps, um, the timekeeper may not know when to stop and start on time. And any number of disasters that you can imagine that can happen will happen. This guy was 35. Who knows what kind of heart condition he may have had. And God bless him. And who knows how many fights he may have had previously. Who knows if he had any previous break. I mean, who knows what conditions he had when he walked in there. To me, it is not coincidental that all but one death in North America that has happened in MMA has happened in amateur MMA. It's just not coincidental. It's just not. Um... Um, and um, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. And you got people like in South Dakota. I mean, I understand people don't want to do a ton of shows out in South Dakota, but you've got the governor and legislatures out there clamoring to ban it as if this is some sort of solution to the problem. I mean, just idiocy run amok over there. Uh, a, a complete abdication of responsibility on their part, a complete abdication of evidentiary based decisions. It is appalling. It is appalling. Um, what is the short-term solution? Don't fight amateur MMA. Seriously, do smokers in your gym, um, which are you know a, a little less contested, a little more than sparring, not quite as much as fights. Um, you also know the people you're sparring against, uh, and then just turn pro and fight on low-level pros. Fight bums for a while if you have to, but I just would not recommend fighting amateur MMA. I just wouldn't. Um, at least with pro MMA, there are states that don't have. There are plenty of states. Like Michigan, I believe that regulate pro and don't regulate amateur, or the distinction between the two. Like some states will farm out amateur regulation to, um, you know, these third, like the ISKA or the PKA or something like that. It's just it's just dangerous. It's just dangerous. I, I, I cannot be more clear about that. Do not fight amateur MMA if you're on the East Coast outside of New Jersey. Don't do it. And that goes for D.C. and Virginia and Maryland, too. Most of the time, these promoters are just trying to make a buck off of you. Like, I remember the early days of MMA. I'll get to the next question here. I remember when I said early days. Early days post The Ultimate Fighter. I remember um, the majority of the shows that were around, at least in this particular area, and I'm sure this was true for across the country in many parts, the majority of shows that popped up were amateur shows because, first of all, that's, that was, was the huge population of fighters available to you people that had recently gotten into it and wanted some competition, but also because it was easy, it was unregulated, um, you don't have to pay any of the guys, you can open up on the, in D.C., the Prince William County Fair or the Virginia Beer Fest, um, throw up a tent, put a ring inside or, you know, a cage, whatever it was back in the day, and uh, have guys go at it. Call up your local Yamasaki affiliate, call up your local at the time, Little Irvin affiliate, call up... Um, you know, Jeff Gordon school, or even not those schools, just nonsense schools. Those are all good schools, but I mean other nonsense schools. And um, and just find somebody, put them together, and there you go. Now, obviously, um, it's much more regulated now, but even still, 
Virginia, I remember somebody called me once, get this, and this will lead to the little Fallon Fox thing, unfortunately. Uh, somebody called me once. There was going to be an amateur show at the uh, Dulles Center Town, uh, Dulles Town Center Sportsplex, I forget exactly what it's called. Uh, it's not Operation Octagon, it was another one, I think. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was. Um, some other show. And they, were, they didn't do it, but they were going to put a man versus a woman. Uh, they were going to put a like a 16 year old or 17 year old kid against a fully developed like 25 year old woman as like a, as like a spectacle. And there's nothing illegal about that. Just do not fight amateur MMA. I cannot be clear about it. Uh, and someone says, I think Dana even said something to the effect that if you run an amateur promotion, you're an a hole. Amateur just means you don't pay your fighters. He's right. He absolutely is right. I could not agree more. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how to answer this one. I'm not going to critique a colleague, nor is there much to critique anyway. Uh, have you ever been in a similar situation during an interview where the guest said something so ridiculous that you were a bit shell-shocked? Uh, stop, cat. No. Yeah, over here. Um, let's see. Yes, not the, I've never been in a situation quite like that. But I can definitely tell you I've been in situations where um, you sort of let a guy go because you don't know what else to do. Um, and let's just be clear about the burden of like you know blame here. I mean, how how is anyone? saying anything other than Matt Mitchell is to blame here. Uh, I certainly don't hate the guy. I don't know him. Um, I've interviewed him a couple times. He was great. Totally reasonable. I'm, I'm sure outside of this issue, he might be a more reasonable guy. He lost his mind here a little bit, but um, or quite a bit, actually. But, um, yeah, I've definitely been in situations where a guy was saying something, and I was like, you know, you just sort of like had this out-of-body experience where you were listening to, to this weird stuff, and... Um, you're not sure what to do about it. Uh, there's some dude tweeting me right now that just, boy, he hates transgender people, huh? All right. All right. Let's just get into this situation, shall we? Political correctness blinding common sense. All right. Number one. Do you think they, I'm not sure who they is, but do you think they would be sanctioning Matt if he if he would have used those exact same words to address one of his male opponents, or would they be featuring it in a promo? Um, I'm not sure. Oh, I see what you mean. Like if he was saying if he called one of his somebody a disgusting freak and sick and sociopathic, uh, they might, they might. Um, but sort of you have to understand that a here's what I'm trying to get across to you. Um, <laughs> I'm only speaking from a position of what medical science and um, modern experts in, in fields of psychology and psychiatry and mental health professionals have to say about this. Um, being transgender, to the extent that I understand it, is not uh, a disease like, say, bulimia or uh, body issues that can be treated with um, various sort of non-invasive forms of therapy. Over 40 years of research, it has proven to be ineffective. It does not solve those issues. Um, oh my God, I gotta ban this guy, Jesus Christ. He's not quoting Thomas Paine. Like, you know the first thing about Thomas Paine. Good Lord. All right, there we go. Um, it is a serious, deeply psychological, and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a problem that has much deeper roots about self-image, about one's identity. Um, it's a huge problem, and it cannot be solved. And this is not my opinion. This is what medical research has shown. It cannot be solved so easily by sort of basic medication uh, and, and sort of traditional forms of therapy, like you say if you were depressed or, again, had bulimia or some other kind of similar issue. So, what we're talking about here with people who are transgender, whatever your opinion of them, this is a deeply complicated problem. And it's a problem that medical science tells us they deal with from very early ages because 
transgender people don't. Like in Valen Fox's case, she made the turn at 31. Um, some of them make it in their early years. Some of them make it prepubescent. Some are postpubescent. Uh, post uh, uh, some are much more later into adulthood. It also sort of depends on a variety of circumstances, not least of which is the cost of surgery and everything else. It's a huge, complicated process. What if they even want to go through with it? All kinds of stuff. Um, so you're talking about a particular kind of people with a uh, not just a deep uh, problem that they've had to deal with sort of internally, but there are any number of laws that are discriminatory and any number of practices that are discriminatory against them. Not least of which, so for example, I got somebody emailing me, and he wrote a very fair, well-worded email, and I appreciated it. And it was kind, and he wasn't asking anything the wrong way, so I'm not bashing the guy. But he sort of said, like, I'm an insurance agent, and if, you know, males typically have higher rates of insurance uh, premiums than women because they do crazier stuff. Guys ride motorcycles more often than girls, stuff like that. Um, so they die earlier, so they have higher insurance premiums, which I understand. He goes, and if you get a transgender switch, they don't change, depending on when it happens, they don't necessarily change how they identify your gender, right? So, but to me, it's like sort of antiquated ideas and antiquated laws that aren't kept up to speed um, don't necessarily prove a point. The reason why they might use Matt's statement about um, another opponent is because his opponent probably isn't an aggrieved minority in a deeply oppressive situation. That's probably why. Um, well, you know, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. I, I, I suspect that's probably not the case. And I want to make this clear before I say anything else about this Fallon Fox situation. If you're looking and listening to what I'm saying now and you're thinking that I'm saying she should fight, you are wrong. You are wrong. My response right now is to say I don't think she should be granted a license anywhere to fight until we really know more about this. And it's not because I dislike Fallon Fox at all. Um, the central question here isn't whether or not transgender people are sick. It's about they're a reality and they're not going away. So the question is not about my feelings about transgender people in that particular sense. It's about whether or not as a reality does their situation confer at any athletic benefits post-operative and after a certain amount of guidelines have been met those by the IOC or the NCAA. Yes or no? And it seems to me like we don't necessarily have a clear answer. Some of the doctors who are who say that they don't have any athletic advantages often maybe have some skin in the game. There are some who question whether, whether the while well, uh, hormones and bone and skin density, while those things can be changed and the ability to put on muscle mass and retain water and sort of all these sort of characteristics that women live with in athletics, while those can be mimicked. There's some sort of biomechanical issues with the shoulder and hip movement uh, and some other, sort of other things that really can't be undone. And I'm sympathetic to those arguments. This is not a question about, uh, this is not a uh, soapbox for me to tell you that Fallon Fox deserves to get licensed. Not saying that. There is a clear room for debate. Clearly room for debate. What I am going to tell you is, if you say things like, it's a dude who chopped off her genitalia. You're a terrible person. First of all, you're cruel. You're just cruel, number one. Uh, secondly, you have no understanding of modern biology. You have no understanding of the vast amounts of decades of research that have gone into transgender studies. And you are saying things you simply don't know to be true. You're just making up things. And you're saying them in this hugely hateful, discriminatory way absent any rational basis. Again, if you don't think she should be fighting women because the transformation confers athletic benefits, I can listen to that argument. If your argument is that she got transgender surgery to beat up on women, you're a terrible person. And, and I'm sorry to say it in such a way, you are a cruel, cruel person to be saying something like that. To, to, to have uh, a condition from basically birth or any sort of moment of, of sentient self-awareness that they have difficulty dealing with, to be an aggrieved minority, to have to go through unbelievable financial, emotional, and social torture and turmoil to make a decision for themselves that they'll never be able to um, live down. I mean, they're always going to be sort of uh, in a position where they're going to be discriminated against fairly or unfairly. Uh, and to say that it's as simplistic a reason so that they can get a little bit of extra advantage, 
against women is the is 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 seriously, folks, the dumbest thing I have ever heard. It is, and I've said it a lot. I've heard a lot of dumb things, and I've said it a lot. I'm telling you, if you say that, I I I. I'm not religious. I pray for you. I pray for you. I don't know how many different ways I can say it. If you don't believe Fallon Fox should be given a license, we can talk about it. If you think that somebody got a sex change so they can beat up on women, you need help. You need professional help. Number two, Fox has the ability to look like a woman thanks to technology we have in medicine. Let's say 50 years from now, we can make machines look like humans and have all all the same biological attributes and weaknesses of a human. Should they be allowed to fight real humans? It's a very difficult question to answer. But again, sort of the, 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 the key issue here is whether or not we're holding up competitive equity, whether or not it is a fair competitive enterprise we are putting forward. And if there's any evidence to suggest that we're not, be it for transgender people, be it for people with crazy pituitary glands, be it for people who are it's the sort of like weird example you've listed, robotic. I'm all too happy to hear it. We have got to make sure that these people who are competing fairly, competing honestly, are treated in an ethical, humane way. And I don't mean transgender, I mean all MMA athletes. Uh, <laughs> three, if we had the medical ability to make humans look like monkeys, would they be monkeys or just look like monkeys? Here's what I say about that. Don't shave or get a haircut for a year. You're going to look like a monkey. Don't trim your nails. Don't cut your hair. Don't shave your dude. Don't shave. Don't do nothing. Don't do nothing. See what you look like after a year. You'll straight up look like Cornelius from Planet of the Apes. Reza Madadi. At his age, I don't see him ever contending for a title. But seriously, how fun is that guy? A complete maniac at the weigh-ins, a total gentleman in victory, and a pretty skilled... And pretty skilled in the cage as well. I particularly enjoyed his trip takedowns. Am I the only one who thinks MMA could use a few more loose cannons like him? Nope. And I love the way you set that up too because, listen, as you know, the age, it's an issue. Um, Skill-wise, is he really on a level where he can contend for a title at any point in the future? Seems highly unlikely. However, um, I, you know, and uh, I mentioned this in Bellator. Frodo Hospital Live is a similar way. I think, oh, I think Frodo's more of an elite fighter. Certainly younger, has a little more upside. But guys who fight with chips on their shoulder, guys who fight getting after it, um, guys who maximize whatever resources they have. And typically you find that often among guys who don't necessarily have resources like George St. Pierre. Like, can I really say that George St. Pierre fights as hard as Reza Madadi? No. Now, the point is he doesn't have to. He can use half of his arsenal and still beat guys at a much higher level, and that's all great. That's a much more important level to the game. But I completely agree with you that there is something special about MMA where you can get guys who are just good enough, and they make up for it with ferocity and with enthusiasm and with, um, at the end, ultimately, a fair degree of sportsmanship. So, yeah, I'm all in on Reza Madadi. Luke, why are you so angry? <laughs> this one, everyone wants me to answer this one. It's got like a million wrecks. Um, all right, here we go. Why are you so condescending and asinine when responding to comments that differ from your opinion? Do the people who make up the community not deserve some semblance of respect if their comment is respectful, merely deviating from yours? Please reply. I'm trying to decide which, I think you're saying, which MMA site to support. I have been here for years and do not appreciate your unnecessarily snide remarks as of late. If you plan on continuing without reflection, I will move on. I understand it is your personality, and I appreciate your honesty, but there is a line you cross without provocation. Thanks for your time. So uh, let me answer this question because I am all too happy to do it. And I don't, I, I don't like, um, I, I don't like making these chats. I do it sometimes more than I should, but believe me, I don't like making them all about me. This should be about the topics at hand, but I'll answer this one because it comes up a lot. So listen, there's no denying that like um, some of the ways in which I answer questions, in fact, I'm sure the way I just previously did it, piss people off. But I'm not sort of willing in those particular cases to give audience to people who hold ludicrous views. So I want, one, I want you guys to understand something. I've been publishing articles on fairly large platforms in MMA since basically, I mean, I was on Bloody Elbow in 2007, but it wasn't very big. So let's just say 2008. From 2008 and on, there's been a pretty fairly decent sized audience for my material. I mean, not, not writing in the New York Times, but you get the idea. Like if you con if you write an article, there'd be 30 comments or more. Um, 
it does, let me make this absolutely clear, and this doesn't just go for me, this goes for everybody on the side. This goes for Oriol, Mike Chiapetta, Dave Doyle. This goes for Sean El Shadi. This goes over to Bloody Elbow. This goes for Kid Nate. This goes for Brent Brookhouse. This goes for everybody. Everybody, everybody. In today's methods of publishing and the way information is created, the way it's published, and the way it's disseminated, and the way in which the audience has been empowered to be part of a larger discussion about news and debate and topics, it has created a reality where no matter what you say, there is now an audience that has a platform to disagree with you. Right? And here's what I mean. It used to be the case in traditional methods of publishing that people who were outside of the scientific consensus, people who believed in phlogiston, right, you could drown them out. You could drown them out. And you would basically be able to talk at a, at a fundamental level between experts. There would be disagreement, that some, of course, but you'd be able to talk from a basic position of understanding that would take for, uh, as fundamental certain tenets. Uh, that is not possible anymore. It's not possible in MMA. It's not possible in politics. It's not possible in technology writing. It's just not possible. There is somebody at every turn who was willing to question everything, and it happens every time you hit the publish button. Every time. Every time, every article, anyone at SB Nation has ever written. Even that Chael Sonnen article I did with the interview I did with him, the, t uh, the technique uh, talk. Many, many of you guys liked it, and I appreciate you reading it. Um, even then, emails about uh, how this was wrong. And then they sort of, uh, uh, and not just that it was wrong, but it was wrong in fundamental ways that were clearly irrational. It's impossible. So this idea that I don't, uh, there's, this, there's this fantasy that, like, you don't take criticism well. No, I don't take bad criticism well. I don't take clearly irrational criticism well. I do not suffer fools gladly. That is true. That is true. However, uh, however, however, what I would say is um, the amount of criticism that you get in this business, and it doesn't matter how good you are. Ben Folks is a great writer. I'm sure he gets ridiculous criticisms. It's just inevitable. Um, what it does do is it turns your ear into, into uh, such a way where you get an ear for criticism. Perfect example. I did an interview with Jordan Burroughs um, in 2012, maybe even 2011. And I think, uh, I think 2011, because I think it was still a long time before the Olympics, and he had already won his NCAA title for the second time. And it was a good interview. Like, people liked it. In fact, you look at the comments, everyone was like, yeah, great interview, blah, 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 blah. And then I got an email. I hate email. And it was long. And the guy tore me to pieces. But he never called me a name. He never, he, it wasn't full of misspellings. But that's, those are sort of superficial arguments. He clearly was somebody with a knowledge base that I did not have. And he clearly was in a position to inform me. And I was so moved by that email. And I couldn't believe how good it was that I refused to not to let this guy go. Struck up a conversation with him. And now that guy is Mike Reardon, who is, I don't give a F what anybody says, the best writer in MMA talking about wrestling. He's over a bloody elbow. That, that came from hate email. That came from hate email. So this notion that, like, I, you're automatically disagreeable with people who don't agree. No, no. I refuse to have any tolerance for nonsense. And you can say that that's disagreeable, too. I refuse to give audience to people who are clearly speaking from a position of ignorance that is unsalvageable. I will not have dialogue with these people. And I will, I, life is just too short. Life is just too short. When, you, when you're like... When you're in a position like me, and many journalists are, and much, much greater, where everything you publish does not matter. You will get plenty of uh, love and appreciation that's as blind and undevoted and, and nonsensical as the hate you get. You have to sort of find the in-between, the people who are trying to criticize in an intelligent, thoughtful, new, and interesting way, and, the, and, and in a way where they're trying to foster understanding and foster dialogue. Because they're not out there publishing things about war crimes or absolving dictators of, uh, of uh, you know, human rights abuses. I'm talking about MMA. So there's nothing to sort of morally be overly objectionable about. Um, to the extent that you want to disagree with me, I need you to disagree with me. You make me better when you disagree with me. But if you think that I don't like it because I don't want to hear it, I, I don't have a choice. 
I don't have a choice, and neither does Ariel, and neither does Mike, and neither does Sean, and neither does Dave, and neither does Dave Meltzer. None of us have a choice. The second we hit the publish button, somebody is there. Somebody is there who's not going to like it. And if they don't like it because they have a point to make because they're thinking about it, it's important to them, and they understand the nuances, I have no choice but to listen to them. You will make me better. But if your only position is that you're crazy and you don't know how to form a coherent argument, well, I don't have the time. I just don't have the time. Well, I cannot argue with everybody who tweets me something of, that is a river of NA nonsense. I cannot devote my time to that. So let me just clear this up today. It is true that I come across, or at times, condescending. And it is true I come across, at times, pompous. And I apologize. It's not intentional. And maybe it's worse that it's not intentional. I am sorry about that. I do not mean to be hurtful. But life is too short to deal with inanities. I do not have time for criticism that comes from a place of profound ignorance and silliness. Here we go. Perfect example. Sir, you're going to get banned because you just don't know how to talk. Oh, whoops, that's not me. All right. Matt Mitrio has been suspended for violating UFC's code of conduct by calling Fallon Fox a sociopathic, disgusting freak. That's true. I'm pretty sure Chael Sonnen has violated the code of conduct many times. Why hasn't he ever been suspended? Here you have a guy who has called Anderson Silva a dirtbag, a coward, and even disrespected an entire country, yet the UFC hasn't suspended him. Why do you think that is? I realize that it's being called a coward or a dirtbag is pretty light compared to calling a sociopathic disgusting freak, but still, I feel that the UFC is going to punish fighters for disrespecting others, and it should have some consistency. I think a couple of responses there. One is that... Um, I don't know that the code of conduct was in place when those comments were made. I think the code of, I, I don't know exactly the timeline, but I believe that's right. I believe that the majority of the things that you highlight, some of the more disagreeable comments that uh, people make, or excuse me, that people make, that Sonnet has made, I think they came before um, that code of conduct. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's the case. I think the other thing is that I don't know, I don't know what to tell you. Um, I think you highlight a great point. There's complete inconsistency across the board. I would certainly say that the LGBT community has been a stronger focus of the UFC, given all the issues that have happened all the way back to that Loretta Hunt video where she was called the C-word that rhymes with Hunt, and um, and where he called Dana White said people who use sources or uh, um, anonymous sources are F-words that rhyme with Baggin. All right, you remember all of this. And he apologized for it, and all that's fine. I don't even care about it anymore. But um, there's been this consistent thing about that happening, and I think the UFC has widely, or wisely used Liz Carmouche to combat this idea that they are, a, I don't think internally that they discriminate against homosexuals in any capacity whatsoever. Um, I, I'm in no way would accuse the UFC of that, but I think as they try to grow their brand and develop their image, uh, as they begin to partner with more prominent entities, like Fox, I mean, it's, it's already been in development, but you get the idea as they want to get to New York, these issues can really derail that progress. I mean, I think tripping over issues about sensitivity towards gay, lesbian, and transgender issues, whatever you think of them, just strategically speaking, they can really trip a company up. I think they've been, they historically have tripped the company up, which is why you saw that swift response. Has there been some inconsistency? I don't, I don't know how you can say there hasn't been. I just don't know how you can say there hasn't been. Oh, Tito, I know you softened your stance on his managerial skills, but how about the latest theory that his UFC 148 bout with Griffin was fixed? This guy just can't help himself, can he? Anything to keep your name in the press, right? Uh, what do you think of Musashi's performance, and what's up with Holland if uh, the UFC will ever get there? I don't know what the state is with Holland in terms of regulation. Um, somebody said that they're more kickboxing-focused. It's far more kickboxing-focused in Holland than it is um, in terms of MMA. Um, but um, Musashi's performance, listen, I initially on Twitter, I was like, my God, end this misery. Because the fight, it's like if you didn't know anything about the situation and you just walked into it, you'd be like, oh, my God, this fight is terrible. But I sort of noted in my signal-to-noise column that, listen, the guy had an opponent change last minute. He had a knee issue. Um, the other guy cut 27 pounds in three days. 
you got to give these guys a break. The fight sucked on its own terms, but uh, in terms of um, you know what had happened, I think you got to be fair to the guy and say that's a pretty good response, all things considered. Uh, why all the hullabaloo over Vadim Finkelstein sitting cage side in Sweden? I know the Fedor fanatics love to hypothesize fantasy scenarios where he'll finally fight in the UFC, but really, is it much more likely that he simply is there to cheer on Musasi, a former client? Just because Dana publicly slams him in the media doesn't mean that they're mortal enemies in person. They could be. Um, the only thing that someone brought up to me was, this dude seems to have real nice seats all the time. <laughs> like the kind of seats that aren't up for sale. Um, I don't know what it means, man. I don't. Uh, I, I personally don't care about it. You know, if they sign Fedor, you guys know how I feel about it. I, the, the greatest heavyweight ever. I'm happy to see him retire and have fun with his children and his wife, or his child, I should say, and his wife. Um, I don't. I don't necessarily want to see uh, a reduced version of him, but there's people are desperate. People are desperate, and also sort of weird that like a guy who got blasted by Dana White is sort of showing up all over Europe in these guys' shows, right? Uh, when will the MMA beat return? Soon. You guys don't understand. If you look at Ariel's uh, MMA Hour now, you can see uh, there's a new studio in the background. Um, they're building it, man. Trust me, it's coming. It's coming. They, we were going to do one a couple of weeks ago, and it didn't work. So. Um, but not, I, I don't mean to say we all showed up and nothing worked. I mean, we couldn't make it work. So it's coming, though. The MMA beat, people like the MMA beat. Um, it's not going away. Bellator 95, can you give us some general thoughts on Bellator's Season 8 finale? thought it was great. Uh, I wouldn't call it amazing, but i call it great. Um, I think Pat Coran is, is ridiculously good. I don't. People ask me how would he do against people in the UFC. I do not favor him against... Um, Aldo, and I do not favor him against Edgar. The Mother Donks, I think you'd give him a run for their money. And Edgar might be a close fight, but I don't. I think Edgar's got a little too much for him. But um, I definitely feel like Haran's probably three and, and anywhere in that top three to five. Uh, outside of that, um, Hospital Live, Richmond, those guys gave it everything. Wasn't quite the fight I thought it would be, but it was pretty good. You know, Carl Parisian, what's left of him, I don't know. Uh, and then Doug Marshall just does what, <laughs> what Doug Marshall does. Uh, Lyman good fights against Dante Rivera sucked. That was no fun. Um, but there was a lot to like about that about that event. Nate Diaz leaves Caesar Gracie, although still training with Caesar. Do you see this as a positive thing for Nate? With things being taken care of outside the cage, will it enable him to perform better inside the cage? Um, I, I certainly think a change was needed. Uh, is going with Kogan the right way? Certainly staying in the situation they were in was not going to get the job done. So, as I mentioned about the Black Zillions, you know, is there um, is hiring Pedro Diaz and Kenny Monday going to solve all their problems? I don't know. But changes needed to be made, and they're making them. So you have to give them the benefit of the doubt while they're at least understanding that improvement's got to happen, and they're trying to take steps to do it. Uh, Luke, give us the name of the journalist you hate so much. Oh, he would love it, but I won't. Um, Pat Coran's destruction of Shabalat Shamhalayev. Shamhalayev overvalued and drained by the tournament format. Coran hitting a stride, combination of both. Really excited to see how Coran progresses. The guy is a beast. Um, the cut for Shamhalayev is bad. He had a short camp, and Pat Coran just continues to get better. He sort of noted in that interview that I, I did where, like, I think, I think, I don't think he'd want to keep doing them, but now that he's champion, he doesn't have to. Here's what I mean. There was a period in his career where he was doing a lot of tournaments, and it made him so much better than he ordinarily would be because it's just this big, long training camp, and it's exhausting, and it's hard, and it's injurious, um, but the dude got good. He got really, really, really good. Uh, and someone's asking, um, I hope he says it, featherweight. He did say, he told us on the Sirius X on Fight Club on Monday that if it means staying active, he would consider going to a catch weight between 145 and 155. Uh, how can the UFC attract more talents like Hall for future tough seasons? Should they follow the Bellator approach and get more prospects to appear on tough? How would this, you fix the situation? Um, I don't. Uh, I don't think they. I mean, listen. They just have to make greater incentives. You, you listen. I'm not here. I, 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 everyone. Every time I talk about tough, I'm like not saying nice things about it, and I don't want to do that anymore because if people like it, people liked the season. People enjoyed the season. I haven't heard that in forever. So I don't want to go out there and just say awful things about it. Um, what I am trying to say, however, 
is as long as there are structural issues with the contract that a lot of people don't like, um, you're not necessarily going to get the best. A lot of guys don't want to fight in that tournament. They'd rather just take their chances on the outside circuit with proper management and, and find their way in. So um, create greater incentives. It's a, sort of the, it's a non-answer, but that's really it. Uh, make it more worth their while, make it financially better, and make it um, less restrictive. Conor McGregor, just wondering how impressed you were with the addition of the feather with uh, the new addition to the featherweight division. Was this the best debut since the Spiders against Chris Lieben? It's up there. It's up there. And someone saying T. Woodley knocking our hair on was a good debut. It was, but there was no expectation about that fight. There was massive expectation about Conor McGregor, and Conor McGregor is central not just because um, he's a great addition to the featherweight division, but if the UFC looks in the mirror or if the UFC brass look in the mirror and say one thing to themselves every day, it's one of them probably is that, my God, we need some better European talents. We need some European talents who can contend for titles. Like putting on a title fight in Dublin or London or Stockholm is a problem because it's going to happen so far in advance. How are you going to sell the right amount of pay-per-views and yada, yada, yada? That's a great problem to have. That's a great problem to have when you have somebody who can put a country on their back, sell a bunch of tickets in a hot market, and you got to figure out how to get that on pay-per-view so everyone else can see it. Um, it's, it's a great problem to have, and it's not one that they have now. Gustafson's not quite there. Bisping probably won't ever get there, uh, and we'll see about McGregor. He certainly has a ton of promise, but to me, that's the most important part. Was yeah, the debut was awesome. One of, up there with one of the best because of the anticipation and because of the delivery, and every, I mean everything went smooth all the way around in terms of his performance. Um, but to me, the most important thing is it creates a possibility where the UFC can go back to these places and have a hero who can put as a nation, um, you know, can carry not just the London city market, you know, Mike Easton can carry D.C. if we come back here, if the UFC comes back here. You can't carry America on his back. George St. Pierre can carry Canada on his back. And Ireland's a much smaller country than Canada and America, but you get the point. Like, somebody who can transcend these minor um, territorial distinctions and become somebody great. They need that in Ireland. They want that in Ireland. And he could, could be that guy. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Cormier versus Kane on the MMA Junkie April 8th podcast. Cormier said he would be willing to fight Kane if he can't cut the light heavyweight or loses to Jones. What do you make of the sudden change of narrative? And who would you pick to win? Um, that's tough. I don't know how they spar. I would love to know how they spar. Um, I'd probably pick Velasquez. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I want to see how Cormier looks against Mir, first of all, before I can make that little judgment. But um, I think it's kind of inevitable, right? Like, why would he – what other choice does he have? If he can't make the cut or he doesn't beat Jones, why would he just want to keep fighting at light heavyweight? Got to, got to go up there and uh, – here we go. Bellator doing a 265-pound Summer Series tournament, man. Whatever. Um, anyway, so um, I don't know who to favor, but I, 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 they're on a collision course, and there's nothing you can do about it, it seems like. Hector Lombard looks like he's finally teaming up with Mike Dolce to try and make a run at 170. How do you think he'd do in that division? Well, dropping won't solve all of his problems, but it'll solve a major one, which is that against Yushin Okami, he was clearly outsized. And it's not about Yushin Okami or not Yushin Okami. Hector Lombard is a blown up welterweight fighting at, at middleweight. He is a he is a welterweight. He should be a welterweight. It's a much better weight class for him. He's not young. Uh, I think he's 34 or more. Um, and like I said, some of his issues have nothing to do necessarily with weight cutting. I think some of the way he uses his footwork and some of the ways in which he initiates striking exchanges, those might still plague him as he moves down to welterweight. However, um, at least he won't have to deal with guys who can, and this is crazy to say, lean on him and muscle him around. That shouldn't be happening, you know. Uh, Olympic wrestling gold medalist Kenny Monday joining the Black Zillions. Sign of, <coughs> sign of better things to come from that camp, or do their issues run deeper? And I know Kenny has an MMA fight on his resume, but does he have experience with wrestling as it relates to MMA? How important is that attribute in an MMA wrestling coach? Uh, I can tell you that a lot of wrestling enthusiasts who are sort of very, very, very casual MMA fans didn't think this was the best call. 
I think Kenny Monday, is, as you mentioned, his uh, hat is, um, you know, his, his MMA resume is thin. His understanding of it might not be that great. They already have some pretty good wrestlers in the camp. Uh, it might be a little more sizzle than steak. And that he also apparently has a bit of a head case. I don't know. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, you know, I, I don't think you have to be an Olympic gold medalist to be a great MMA coach. I want to sort of make that clear. Like, I don't know that Kale Sanderson is a better MMA coach for wrestling than Chael Sonnen is. You know, I, in fact, I'd probably not favor him over Chael Sonnen. Um, but I don't think it's the same as saying you can get a middling wrestling fighter uh, who just wrestled D1 and has maybe had a couple fights in the UFC, and he's a better wrestling coach necessarily than someone who's got a great prize. You don't want to value Olympic credentials necessarily over um, um, somebody who has both MMA and wrestling experience, but you don't want to undervalue it either. I mean, these are, you know, freestyle rules are what they are, but um, he, I suspect that, you know, he could probably be a good contribution. We'll just have to see. But is that going to solve all their problems? No, I think the central focus is that they don't have a sim they don't have one guy who runs the show. I think that to me is the bigger component. They need one guy who everyone else does whatever the f he says. Crowd question: One thing I really noticed from UFC on Fuel Nine was the positive atmosphere created by the supportive, encouraging Swedish crowd during the fights. They applauded effort where appropriate and refused used to boo when the fighters weren't swinging for the fences. They did boo a little bit, though. I say this because it's a quite stark difference from the palpably venomous crowds we often see and experience here in North America. Does it bother you like it does me when fans can't resist needling the fighters during bouts when the action isn't guns a-blazing? Um, yes, but I, there's no solution to it. This is the audience that watches the sport, and uh, it's part of our culture, I think, and I think we're stuck. I don't really have a good answer for you. I I like I admit, like you, it's refreshing to see something else, but we're stuck. We're stuck, and it sucks that we're stuck. Fans' response to Mitch Rion's suspension. I was quite appalled by the uproar from fans regarding Mitch Rion's suspension and their support for what he said. Yes, we all know freedom of speech is important, but calling a transgender person, no matter the context, context, a disgusting freak crosses the line, and it's perfectly reasonable for a high-profile company to want to separate themselves from that. Your thoughts? Um, I agree. I agree. Um, and I sort of want to make one more point here that I think needs to be made. Like, you know, people are like, oh, yeah, and the guy who responded to him called him, called her she in quotations. Uh, you can't do that. Right, and it's not like you can't do that. People sort of say, "Well, that's because you're being politically correct." No, I'm being medically correct. I'm being scientifically correct. It, it, I know this sounds like I'm just forcing like transgender culture down your throat. I am not an expert in this. I do not know or have any friends that are transgender that I'm aware of. It's not about that. It's about sort of thinking about the issues and looking at the relevant facts. Gender is much more a function of self-identification and hormones than it is about chromosomes. Like when he trotted out this argument that like, oh, he was born with an XY. Uh, in terms of what dictates maturation and development uh, between men and female, men and women, uh, chromosomes takes a much further backseat than uh, hormones. In some ways, I won't say irrelevant, but um, uh, we're talking about a dramatically different role. Hormones is a much, much, much uh, greater influencer of what constitutes um, sex. And gender is much more a function of, of identification as a function of that. So calling Fallon Fox he is both biologically wrong, socially irresponsible, and rude, um, and inherently divisive. And it doesn't need to be done. You, here's the point about this, and I, I, I want to make sure I circle back every time. If you do not feel like she should be fighting men, or excuse me, women, because it, her condition confers an athletic advantage that no amount of hormonal therapy can undo, we can talk about that. Because I don't have the answers. I think there's a healthy debate to be had there. If your point is that it's really a dude who cut off her junk, cut off his junk, and I don't care what anybody else says, the chromosomes say this, we cannot have a conversation. And you, frankly, do not belong in the conversation. 
They are a reality. There's a medical reality to this. There's a scientific reality to this. I don't care about any political undertones that may or may not be approached here. I'm only speaking on those considerations, and I'm also speaking of the reality that transgender people are not going away. We need to figure out whether this works. I will also say, let's say that they do grant her a license, that we have enough scientific and medical understanding about her condition and about the, any athletic benefits that are conferred, and we decide that they're negligible. And when I say we, I mean the sort of the community in general through that kind of informative fact-finding process. Does it mean that all transgender athletes should be able to compete? No. Does it even mean that um, the reverse could be true? That, well, because Fallon Fox got in, what if a woman becomes a man, well, should she be able to fight? Maybe the disadvantage is too strong. I'm, all I'm telling you is letting her in doesn't necessarily open the floodgates. Um, this is a careful, deliberative process that needs careful, deliberative attention. And that's the kind of energy you should spend on this. Not putting she in quotations uh, and saying this is a person who did all these things to achieve uh, some kind of minor advantage or whatever kind of advantage in MMA competition, which is a profoundly, profoundly inhumane and cruel, cruel way to look at this. They are reality. We need to figure out what to do about it. Uh, let's see. Frank Yeager versus Charles Oliveira. What do you think of the matchup of Frank Yeager and Charles Oliveira? Love it. Um, I think Oliveira is good. I think uh, he might even cause a few problems if they go to the floor. I think Frank Yeager is going to get in and out of range and bust him up, however. I think Frankie's going to take that. I think Frankie beats everybody but Aldo, basically. Uh, let's see. MMA camps. If you were an up-and-coming fighter, what camp would you train at and why? I don't know. And there's different ways to measure like a camp's value. One is resources they can give you. Another is relationships with different promoters. Another is, for example, American Top Team. They go out to the NCAA national championships and recruit people. You know, how many camps have a recruiting element to it? Like that, that to me is really sort of amazing. Um, um, there's lots of ways to sort of value camps. I'll, I'll tell you this though. Um, I had a conversation with. Uh, one very famous fighter, and I won't say his name, but he was saying that like so many of these guys make the mistake of going to these super camps where they get injured a lot and they're just sort of like another one among many and they think because they have the most resources they'll get the most attention when in fact it's the opposite. You want to go to a mid-size, not a small camp, but a mid-size camp where you can be when you need to be the complete star of the show. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know. Um, but that was his opinion and, and he felt like many, many, many fighters, both young and experienced, made a mistake by just going to these huge super camps. Uh, all right. Gunnar Nelson's wrestling, and he's injured now, too. I still don't have an answer for you. Uh, Invicta and the UFC. With the UFC and Invicta establishing a working relationship, where do you think this is going in the long run? Will Invicta stay independent, or are they ultimately going to be swallowed by the UFC? Um, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I think UFC and Zufa don't manage two organizations well at the same time. I really would hope that they would not do that. I like that the work they have a working relationship. It's good for women, it's good for Invicta, uh, it's good for MMA in that larger sense. Um, but when they get swallowed by UFC, they get swallowed by UFC. It's not like they live in a particular place where they're gonna be able to thrive. When they're on their own and they have a working relationship, they're still ultimately the masters of their own destiny and responsible for their own success. When they're under uh, UFC's control, UFC will just cherry pick the absolute best at will and leave Invicta with everybody else. And I think now, currently at Invicta, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, Invicta isn't going to play hardball with the UFC, but you know, uh, if Invicta, if Invicta was part of Zufa, would Cyborg have been able to do what she did? I don't think so, but maybe. Seeing as how this Fallon Fox situation has ruffled some feathers, I'm curious, Lucas, to know what your feelings would be on a hermaphrodite fighter. Okay, so this is sort of like what I'm talking about here. I know it's an honest question, and I want to be mean. Um, and certainly there probably needs to be some sort of regulation about it. But understand that there are way more transgender athletes, as much of a minor minority as they are, than there are going to be hermaphrodites. Let's please, um, it's a 
I admit that there's a difficult situation. I don't have any answer for you, but I don't want to conflate, um, you know, hermaphroditism with uh, a much more common and relevant social and medical issue, that being transgender fighters or athletes, I should say. UFC Korea. Is there any chance the UFC is going to South Korea this year? I hope so. I've been saying this for a long time. People keep asking me and other, and other people as well. What is the next big market? What's the next hot market? South Korea, man. They've got to be. They've got to be ready to burst. I don't know if people, are, uh, if there's a worry about the some of the major, maybe political or economic considerations given what's going on in there right now. Uh, if you don't know, South Koreans live on a ton of credit card debt. There's a bit of a bubble there in that particular sense. Um, obviously, things with North Korea are not particularly great. I have no idea if that's even relevant, or maybe that's just sort of like my imagination run wild. Um, I know there's cable deals to be had there, I, and I already already have some great ones as well. There's a, there's a ton of great fighters that come out of there. There's a budding regional scene there. Road FC, I think, has an event this weekend. So I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Top five MMA camps. I don't even know. That's tough. No Lulu now has got to be, got to be close to the top. Injured fighters. Is there a ruling that fighters cannot withhold any non-visible injury information to the UFC prior to a fight? Yes, you are required to disclose any medical ailment. They just don't. They just don't. I, I, I am. And looking back on it, you have to wonder, like, did Gustafson botch the whole thing? Should he have gone to the commission like so far in advance? And I feel for the guy because I don't really know what the right answer is. He, I, it's difficult. I think he made the right call. And the reason why is because he looked at the cut when it initially happened. He probably freaked out, first of all. And then when he went and got a cut and he asked how long this is going to take to heal, they probably told him something that didn't match what the reality was of him fighting. So he probably said, oh, my God, what am I going to do? You know, he probably should have called the UFC first and had one of their doctors look at it. Maybe he did. Um, but the problem is this. If he didn't know how it was, it was going to heal and he waited until Friday of the day of the weigh-ins when they get that medical check and they were like, well, dude, we can't. You have this cut that just barely healed. It's going to open right back up with one shot. We can't clear you. Um, then he's ruined the whole thing. At least by giving them a heads up, it gave them a chance to salvage that fight. And it gave Gugard Masasi a chance to fight. And it gave Ilair uh, Latifi a chance to, to do the UFC a solid and get a contract. So, you know, listen, fighters going, I've talked to a million fighters who've done this. They go into these medical things, they're like, no, oh, I'm fine. Meanwhile, their rib is cracked, you know, or some kind of crazy injury they have. They just lie about it, get to the medical and go on. Problem with the facial laceration is that it's just hard to lie about it, man. It's it's literally in your face. Um, it's it's tough. It's a tough, tough call. And I and I, you know, I don't want to bash Gustafson. I think he did what he thought was best, even if in hindsight, maybe he should have stuck it out. I don't know. UFC approaches handling code of conduct based on fighters' value. It's a little weird how they approach each issue differently with fighters who they don't mind to release. For example. With Miguel Torres and Mitrion, they just go for it. With Forrest Griffin, they call him and give him a chance to explain himself. Say it's a joke and so on. I bet with somebody like GSP or John Jones, they would call them first immediately, even if they would say something super sick. Does UFC use their less valuable fighters to take a stance on some issues and otherwise protect those who are of, who are of value? P.S. This is not to defend Mitrion in any shape. I strongly disagree with his comments and totally support UFC's decision. Um, certainly seems that way. Certainly seems that way. Although I also say, as ridiculous as Forrest Griffin's comments were, <laughs> and as ham-fisted as the explanation that was, like he was sort of like watching TV and sort of being contemplative about rape in society. Like this was what was actually happening. Um, I didn't find what he said to be as bad as Miguel Torres, and I don't think. People are saying, well, what about what Joe Rogan said about Fallon Fox? First of all, I, don't, I hadn't even heard about it. I don't know how that happened, but um, I read what he – at least I didn't see the video. I read what he said yesterday, and what I had read was bad. It wasn't as bad. It wasn't nearly as bad as uh, what Matt Mitrion had said. Um, not saying it's good. Certainly not saying I agree with it, but I didn't think – I didn't think the two were tantamount in that sense. So um, – so there is something to be said for the fact that, like, John Jones does dumb stuff 
and George St. Pierre, obviously, so they keeps his head clear. All I'm pointing out is the guys who have more to lose don't seem to be making as many egregious errors. There is something to be said for that. Like, Mitrion's comments are clearly and far and away the worst. Um, also, did I not – maybe somebody can help me out here. I, I think I just read before coming on this, this little air here that um, – uh, UFC is going to release their code of conduct for public consumption. Now they do that, you can hold them hostage to it, right? Because before it was like, we have a code of conduct. Well, what does the code of conduct say? Can't tell you. I mean, you, you know, it might as well not exist in that particular case. Um, so if we know the terms of the code of conduct, then yeah, you can apply them equally. But the UFC also gave themselves a little bit of wiggle room. They all, they, they said, you know, listen, we're going to take this on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think some guys might need counseling. Some guys might need a phone call. Some guys might need to uh, blah, 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 get fired, suspended. And others will be just fine, um, you know, uh, having Matt Hughes talk to them or something. So they gave themselves a little bit of, of, of space. All right. When will the UFC realize that the majority of fans watch and purchase fights due to individual fighters and stars and not due to the UFC brand on its own? Well, I do think it's unfair to criticize the organization for something that was out of their hands. For example, Alexander Gustafson being pulled. It's alarming to see Dana White and Gary Cook so out of touch with the market. Your thoughts? Well, I don't think, I don't think they're really out of touch. But I don't think they want um, – and also, let's be fair. The, the UFC brand does have value. It does. They've eroded it. They eroded it a ton in 2011 and 2012, right? I mean, putting UFC 147 on pay-per-view could not could not be a worse decision than that one uh, in terms of eroding a pay-per-view base of people who are like, I buy UFC pay-per-views. Once you do something like that, and there have been many previous examples before that, but once you do that, you're telling fans to be, to not do that anymore. Um, to, you know, oh, I was the guy who bought all the UFC pay-per-views. Don't do that. Why would you do that? Anyway. Long story short, I think they fixed that problem by, by and large. But um, uh, there is no denying. Folks have to understand how this business works. In the cases of boxing and MMA, the vast majority of what sells tickets and gets ratings and everything else is not the brand. It is the star. Um, it is not the brand that pulls in web traffic. It is the star. Um, people are attracted to what they like and, and are repelled by what they don't like. And certainly the UFC creates a, a baseline and a means for exposure in ways that other shows don't. Um, but uh, unequivocally, it is about the stars. But I don't think UFC wants to have their brand be like Golden Boy or Top Rank, where it's a name you hear about. But if you, you know, listen, if you ask, um, they don't do business with each other. But if, you, if, if Pacquiao did fight Mayweather, would any fan know that this was a big deal because Golden Boy was working with top rank? Would anybody know that? No. And I think if, if – but if you see a big MMA event and then everyone's on pay-per-view, everyone knows it's like a UFC pay-per-view. And I think they don't want to lose that. They want to keep that. Um, they might say some things that are clearly in contradiction with what we know to be true, but they're just pushing their company line. I don't really think there's anything wrong with that, even if we know the distinction between the two. Uh, let's see. All right, let me refresh this because I'm running out of green on this. Let's see, let's see, let's see. While I'm doing that, I'll go over to Twitter. Uh, could Fallon Fox have a meaningful career? Wouldn't all her wins be second guessed? For the time being, it certainly seems that way. Uh... Let's see. Boy, there's a million comments you guys put up here. I appreciate that. All right, let's get through these. <laughs> Tito Ortiz. <laughs> Who, what do you make about Tito Ortiz? I make Tito Ortiz. Tito's going to Tito, man. Um. Uh, you know, let the guy do what he wants to do. Is he not entertaining at this point? Like, what is so harmful about Tito Ortiz at this point? Like, people get so mad about it. Tito Ortiz, man, he's just like the drunk at the bar who just says crazy stories. And they may be true, they may be not be true, but just listen to a couple of them. They're fun. Um, 
If a UFC event absolutely has to deliver, who would you put in the main event if you could pick? Well, see, what does that mean, deliver? And I know I'm always, like, equivocating and stuff like that. It's probably annoying, but, like, is your is your definition of of that, uh, is it um, Stan versus Silva, where they're just murdering each other? Or is it closer to, like, you know, something like... Um, Koran versus Pitbull, which was which was a slow boil, and the two was, it was super technical. Um, I prefer the latter, although I do love the former. I would build a fight that gave me both. I would build a fight that gave me just some crazy ass brawl, and then in the main event, I would pick something that I thought would be a better reflection of high level MMA. I'm all that, that's just me. I'm not saying that's the right answer, uh, but for me personally, I'm always going to lean in that direction. I'm always going to lean in favor of put your best talented fighters in, against elite opposition uh, in, in bouts of significance. And more often than not, you're going to get greatness. Should Kyra Gracie do tough or would it be too tough? She's young, pretty, and has only been training MMA part-time for a year or two and has no actual fights. Funny you mention that. Um... I spoke to somebody. Now, we all saw that video of um, Ronda Rousey just tooling Uriah Hall on the ground. Now, in MMA, I'm sure he'd win because I don't think you're, I don't think Ronda would be able to hold up to his punches, but whatever. In a fun, competitive game of, of just rolling, she won. So, um, so she's obviously very talented. However, I will tell you, and I don't know, maybe it's jealousy. I'm not presenting it as fact. I'm presenting it as what I heard. I have heard from several high-level grapplers. When I say grapplers, I mean um, IBJJF world champions and Abu Dhabi medalists. So the very best. They do not think highly of Ronda Rousey's grappling. Not my opinion. And I'm sure she would tool me. Um, and they particularly noted that I guess she has some video where she shows like her view of the half guard and tricks from half guard. And they were, they were, the word was appalled at it. Um, and there's a case to be made that, yes, you've got really talented women in women's MMA, and particularly in a 135-pound division, but you don't really have anybody who can be an elite grappler. And that's noteworthy because Ronda Rousey's style of grappling is unorthodox. That kisikatami she has, which is where she has here the opponent's head. Her hips are to the mat in an S position, so she's got the head here. Opponent's looking at them in the face, and she's grabbing the back of the elbow here, pinning their shoulders to the mat. Judo, if you can do that for 30 seconds after a throw, you can, um, you can, uh, you, you win the match. Or if you can submit them. But that's called the scarf hold. Katami in Judo. The problem with it is, if I have, this is my arm. I don't know if you can see this. I need to make sure you guys. If this is my arm, this is the crook of my arm, and their head is here, and I'm wrapping around the neck, I don't have an underhook here. And so that means you can just take my back. You have to have an underhook. I have to have this arm underneath their armpit and the back of their head. So that blocks them from coming around the back. If I just have my the head, and remember, that's where you come from for a hip toss over the top. Right? You're, you're just a headlock. Now, you can get that bulldog choke and you can yank real tight. But here's what I'm pointing out to you. Have you noticed Ronda Rossi gets her back taken a lot? Carl Parisian had his back taken a lot. Um, I'm not sure about Rick Hahn. I haven't seen enough. I don't think anyone's really done that, but um, or maybe uh, Chandler got his back. Chandler got his back too, but for different reasons. But you notice on those throws, a lot of those throws, they don't start from an, uh, a wizard position. A wizard is an, an overhook of an underhook. So if someone gets an underhook on you and you overhook, that's a wizard. And you need that wizard for all takedown stuff, uh, defense. I'm pointing out to you is she did it on uh, Liz Carmouche too. There's not only ways to get out of the Kesekatami, which is you know it's painful, but more importantly. Um, judo players in MMA and in nogi give their back up all the time. And I guess what I'm trying to point out to you is I really wonder what would happen if a seriously sick, very, very talented, tough jiu-jitsu uh, champion in women's MMA got in there and started mixing it up. Alexis Davis is, uh, uh, interests me. She looks like she has something going there. Um, but that's what I mean. I'm not here to impugn her skills in terms of Ronda Rousey. All I'm pointing out to you is there is something about judo and that scarf hold I'm not convinced of is the best way to grapple necessarily. 
certainly Ronda Rousey has made it work for her, no doubt about it. And you can hear how excited I am about it. Because if you just have the head and the rest of the body is behind and they can shrimp that arm in, you're in trouble against somebody good. They can go base down and bring it forward. They can bring the arm in and then they can base, they can uh, Grammy roll over their shoulders or they can just take your back. Um, because you don't have the underhook. I don't see myself. You don't have that underhook on the far side. This should be in their armpit, not around the head. If I'm around the head, there's nothing stopping them except my pressure on their my if I lift my hips and I sit into the scarf hold, I can keep them pinned. But in MMA, you can't you're not gonna win there. You gotta get out of there, you gotta go do something, they're gonna break you up. And in those transitions, man, I'm telling you, some they get their back taken way too often for my comfort. All right, so they say a bunch of green ones got skipped, so let me go back. UFC 159 promo. Not only did they use We Will Rock You, um, but a cover of that version. It's, it's uh, um, I don't want to curse. Oh, Jordan Breen had the best comment about it. Everyone agrees that that promo sucks. It's completely uninspired and awful, and there's nothing good to say about it. Uh, let's see. Sergio Pettis. Do you think if the introduction of Sergio Pettis will spice up the flyweights or what if Brad Pickett went down to flyweight as he already has a win over DJ? I don't know if he can make flyweight. He's a fairly big bantam. But I do think Sergio Pettis is, um, would be a really awesome um, uh, uh, guy to pick up. All I would say, though, is he needs a little bit more seasoning. Decimal gate. How come there isn't a response from Dana or the UFC about decimal gate? Is that a serious question? Why they wouldn't want to talk about that? <laughs> Why they wouldn't want to talk about having a UFC VP on camera saying, hey, don't worry if you weigh in over uh, 0.9 pounds or less at the very last minute and then having text messages proving that, trying to say that that conversation never took place when they have it on tape. Why would they say that? Why, why would they? Why would they, I, again? I don't blame them. Again, I, they're relaying commission information. It just makes them look bad. Um, why would they not want to talk about that? Oh, I don't know. Bellator's finances. While we can probably all agree that Bellator has had an overall good season on Spike, and knowing that Dana likes to point out that Viacom sits on a lot of cash, I'm still wondering if Bellator is in itself a financially profitable or at least self-sustaining position. Do you happen to have some insight on this topic, or can you maybe make a wild guess as to what kind of financial situation they are probably in as the number two North American MMA promotion? Well, um, it's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I can say that like all those times, like every time you see them go to these casinos, you're like, why do they go to these bumfuck casinos? Um, the answer is that because the casino pays a site fee, they don't have to worry about whether or not people come up to watch the show. Right? A lot of these promotions, they live and die on the fact of who comes up to the gate and buys tickets. Bellator, when they go to those casinos, never had to worry about that. It insulated them from that kind of consideration. But the problem is what happened with that is it built an apparatus that therefore isn't good at reaching out to the public. Um, I've said this before. I think they're probably financially in a profitable place. Um, Bell, you know, uh, Viacom owns them. You know, but although this idea that Viacom can just do whatever they want, I mean, there's a team of, of, of um, you know, shareholders here. Not shareholders exactly, but a team of uh, different people have different levels of ownership, and they have to work in concert for any sort of major decision to be made about stuff like that. So when he's like, Viacom has $5 billion, it's not like, you know, Bjorn Rebbe can go to the ATM and pull out money from the Viacom $5 billion bank account. But I, I want to point out to you that by going to those casinos, they insulated themselves from cost and they insulated themselves from having a failing at, at the gate. But it also created a promotion that is not in 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 touch as much with the NIA community as some other um, promotions. And you guys know I cover Bellator more than anybody in MMA fighting by choice because I like what Bellator produces. Bellator does not for being a number two promotion, it doesn't really have a quality deficit. I mean, there's some, you know, problems here or there. Undercards can be strengthened. They don't need a heavyweight division. Okay. So not, it's not, it's not, the quality is not perfect. But they don't have a quality deficit, but they do have an enthusiasm deficit. If you looked at traffic for what shows like Invicta and World Series of Fighting do, it blows Bellator out of the water, which is weird because 
Bellator can go week after week after week after week, and they can put on these shows where at least one fight every card is a world class quality um, uh, bout between two world class quality competitors, right? So how is that possible? How is it that they've got this much talent? They can go they can go state after state and meet all these regulations and this and that. They can do all these things, um, and they, there's this enthusiasm gap. And like when I say that Invicta and World Series of Fighting do more traffic, I mean they do a lot more. Traffic and not just on MMA fighting, but I've talked to other side editors. It's a, it's 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 universal. It's universal, and so the, to me, what that traffic tells me is not that they don't do good ratings on Spike that they do, and not that the Spike and Bellator partnership is in turmoil. It's not. I think it's a great partnership. I think it works for both people, but I do think that there is an enthusiasm gap that Bellator needs to address. I don't think it's an insurmountable problem, but I think it's one that internally they should acknowledge and they should do something about, and because um, they've got everything else in place. It's a nimble, well-run machine, but it's a machine that's a little cold and distant. Is Frank Mir getting underrated? Uh, I'm picking Cormier too, but Frank is in great shape now. Found a new camp, has incredible jiu-jitsu, some pretty impressive wins, and an underrated stand-up game. Seems like Frank has better chances than what fans seem to be giving him. I don't know that I agree. You know, um, Frank Mir is like one of my favorite fighters. I think he's one of my favorite interviews. I'm considering him for a technique talk. If you've never heard Frank Mir, I don't mean talk, but I mean talk about technique uh, and the game. He's super interesting and, and well-informed, and it's awesome. Um, but I don't know that I like his chances here. I really, really don't like his chances here. I, uh, I, I think Cormier is too much of an athlete. He's way too quick, and he's going to keep it striking and standing, and, and Mir's going to be in a bad spot. Um, I, definitely, I definitely don't. Is he underrated? I don't know, um, but I, I straight up think that it's a bad fight for him. What are your thoughts on Sherman Pendergast's, uh, Pendergast's, or however he spells last time I've forgotten now, uh, nine fight losing streak before he died? Well, I believe he died of cancer, if I'm not mistaken. To what extent that's related to um, a life lived in MMA in terms of injuries? I don't know the answer to that. It sounds to me like there was something else that went wrong. Dana's comments on Mitrion. He wasn't really in a circumstance where he could elaborate on it, but does it bother you that he didn't really denounce the comments? Seemed like he instead chose to focus on fighters doing unnecessary media <clears throat> and the backlash being hard for Mitrion. The UFC has already issued their statement and will surely be grilled about it in interviews leading up to this weekend, but I'm just curious if you have the same takeaway. My takeaway there was, uh, let me ask you this. <coughs> Is there a problem with post-fight interviews ruining the careers of fighters generally. Like if you look at all the, the problems in MMA, there's like TRT, uh, you know, bad refing and judging, not as popular as it could be, and post-fight interviews, I don't think that's the problem. I think um, Dana White likes to blame the media um, as a, like a reflexive position. I think it's ludicrous that post fight interviews are somehow a problem. They haven't been a problem up until now. Um, Pre-fights can be just as bad as post-fights in terms of interviews. And it's an easy, lazy way to um, you know, point the finger. Um, certainly I understand, I agree with you that he got put in a position where he's like, what do you even say? Um, but I just think that Dana White doesn't, I think he's going to issue with the media. I think that's what this stems from. But I think it's pretty obvious to any of us that post-fight interviews are no more uniquely special or um, regurgitating derivative nonsense than pre-fight interviews and are no more dangerous than pre-fight interviews. And this is really a function of a guy having outrageous beliefs and stating them in a terrible way. Uh, now, whether you agree with the punishment he got is a separate issue, but, um, you know, <laughs> I don't think post-fight interviews are a problem. I'll do one more real quick and then we'll get out of here. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Let's just hit the plateau. It's too much. Quick one. All right, well, that's it. Well, let's just one at the bottom here. Uh, 1FC, Rise to Power. Uh, Anario Benario versus Koji Oishi. Edward uh, Foliang versus Kamal Shalarus. I like that one. Phil Baroni versus uh, Suzuki. We've got Fernandez versus uh, Fizaki. And then Andrew Leon. Um, it's okay. Not great. 
Um, although I like how that the featherweight championships between this great guy, Benario, I've seen in the last couple of 1FCs, and the dude who fought Nick Diaz like this. Uh, Sergio Pettis is listed as a flyweight on Chernobyl already. Yeah, I know. I just didn't think he would... Um, I just didn't think uh, he was ready for UFC just yet. Gunnar Nelson Wrestling. I'm going to make a fan post out of this with gifts and shit at this point because I know you guys are tired of asking and I have an answer. All right, so let's wrap this up. I'm sure I'm going to have a million dislikes because we talked about Fallon Fox and I dare to say that she was a human being worthy of respect, but that's what I did. Um, so do me a favor. You can tweet this link out to everybody. Let, you, let them know you listened to the chat today. If your question got answered, you should definitely do that. Uh, like this video. Give it a thumbs up. Um, and this little window here on Google, I would appreciate that. Subscribe to this channel, I would appreciate that too. You can follow me on Twitter at SBN Luke Thomas. That stands for Sports Blog Nation. SBN Luke Thomas, all one word. Um, and I appreciate everyone's time and questions. I got to as many as I can. If I didn't and you really want me to answer it, hit me up on Twitter right now. I'll do my best to do it. Just make sure you use the hashtag chat rappers. That is it for today. Thank you very much. I hope uh, this was as positive an experience and cathartic for you as it was for me. I appreciate everyone's participation. Until next week, stay frosty.